most of their day outside. And so it would make sense that the body would have a mechanism in place that if we were constantly exposed to the UV rays of the sun, we would need a way to protect ourselves against that. And that protection is vitamin D. Because when UVB rays hit the skin, that triggers this whole cascade of reactions where the body starts making vitamin D. And what's amazing about that is vitamin D actually has anti-cancer and anti-melanoma properties to it. In addition to that, it also can have kind of anti-aging in the sense that it protects us from the damaging effects of UV rays. And so it's kind of a pretty brilliant built-in model that our, that our body has. Um, and so and, and, and the scope we're kind of talking about vitamin D here is in relation to the skin. I could probably sit here and talk for a day about all the different benefits of vitamin D. I mean, vitamin D has been shown to be protective against colorectal cancers, metabolic syndrome, fertility issues, um, depression, anxiety, I mean, you name it, and vitamin D, you know, has, has touched it. Because vitamin D has an important role as far as activating our immune system. It activates about 150 genes in the body that regulate immune function. And so when you start to connect, you know, how much, it, you know, our immune system affects, you can start to see where vitamin D does play an important role. But for us, you know, one of the most important things in terms of sun exposure is vitamin D will actually help protect you, you know, from the sun. And so, um, so the recommendation is to spend, if you're a lighter skin person, spend about 10 to 20 minutes in the sun during the midday. You know, it, it's recommended to expose areas of skin that are less sensitive, you know, so your arms, your trunk your legs, um, you know, putting sunscreen on your face will, you know, that's a more sensitive area that will help protect against, you know, the damaging effects um, on the skin of the face. Um, however, darker skinned individuals will need 30 to 40 minutes, which again, when you look back to our ancestral line, this makes a lot of sense because darker skinned individuals tend to be located in areas of the world that were closer to the equator. And so, you know, as you get closer to the equator, the number of days that the UV light or that the sun, you know, the strong UV rays are present is much more. And so it would make more sense that these people spend more time outside. The body, it would, it would make sense that the body would need a, a, a more difficult mechanism of making vitamin D. And so people who have darker skin have a bit of a harder time making it, um, and so they need to spend more time in the sun. And so, um, but roughly, you know, kind of a, a, a good gauge is if you spend about 10 to 20 minutes in the sun, that produces about 10,000 IU of vitamin D. For anybody who takes it, a normal dose that most adults take is anywhere from 1,000 up to about 5,000. So spending time in the sun can actually, you know, help you produce more vitamin D. But vitamin D is also one of our fat-soluble nutrients, so the body can store vitamin D. So again, this mechanism makes sense that especially people, as you move away from the equator, kind of like where we're at here in Kansas, if you spend a lot of time in the sun during the summertime, you would build up your levels of vitamin D to an adequate amount that would sustain you over the winter time. And so, um, you know, so if you're if you're planning on spending more time in the sun, you know, then then this time frame, then you'll you'll you would want to apply sunscreen um, just to kind of help protect your skin, you know, from the damaging effects of UV rays. Um, you know, interestingly enough, I mentioned this in the Health Hunter article. Um, you know, as we as doctors have started measuring vitamin D levels, what they've actually found is that Caucasians in the United States have about a 75%. Um, deficiency rate, you know, and then people of darker skin, that's upwards to 90% of people measured. So, you know, so uh, the, the deficiency of vitamin D is actually, a, you know, rampant. And I would say within our patient population, that's, that's true. Rarely do I see somebody within a normal range who isn't supplementing with some extra vitamin D. So in, the, in that vein, you know, supplementing during the winter time can be a great strategy. Um, you know, to kind of help you, you keep an even, an even um, level of vitamin D. Most adults need to supplement anywhere from five to 10,000 IU per day. Um, you know, one thing to also be aware of is based on our genetics, some people have a harder time making vitamin D. There is an enzyme mutation. If you've done 23andMe, there's an enzyme mutation you can look up that's called the VDR 
enzyme. And that, when you've got that enzyme, sometimes that can speed up or slow down your production of vitamin D. So depending on if you've got that mutation, you might need to take a bit more vitamin D, especially during the winter time. And you know, vitamin D is something I recommend getting measured you know, once or twice a year. Um, we have an open laboratory here at the Rearing Clinic, so you can get it measured here. Or most family doctors now um, don't have a problem with adding vitamin D onto a lab order. So ask your family doctor if he or she will run a vitamin D level and kind of keep close tabs on that. Um, ideally, we like people to be anywhere between 60 and 80, you know, on that on that test. Um, you know, normal range is above 40, but um, but we like people to be a little bit higher, you know, on that on that spectrum. Now, as I mentioned, you know, it, apart from the, the 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 time you spend in the sun to make vitamin D, you will want to apply sunscreen to help protect yourself. But you know, there are some pitfalls when it comes to sunscreen you want to watch out for. Um, you know, sunscreen is one of those, one of those products that actually the, the FDA, the, the, the chemicals that were used in sunscreen were kind of grandfathered in, so in the, in the late 70s. And so the FDA has not closely monitored or regulated some of the chemicals that are used in sunscreens. And so I have listed here a couple that you'll want to watch out for specifically. Um, this top one, especially the oxybenzone, that one has been found in cord blood of babies. Um, you know, uh, I think it's six, about 65% of Americans who are tested for it have it in their, their bloodstream. And um, in this particular chemical, not only does it create irritation to the skin and it creates potential allergies, but it also has an endocrine disruption effect. And so what that means is, is when, when chemicals mimic hormones in the body, you know, they, for instance, this is, is, is an, an estrogen-like compound. If, when this mimics estrogen in the body, in men, that will suppress testosterone levels. And in women, that can actually elevate estrogen levels or elevate the effects of, of these estrogen-like compounds in the body. And so you start to disrupt the body's own ability to manage hormones. And so um, a lot of the sunscreens that are on the market today use, um, use these chemicals to help you know, with the, the protection, the UV protection. The, uh, the second one, the, the oxy, uh, however you say that, oxen, oxenate, I don't, that one I don't know how to pronounce, um, this one can disrupt the thyroid, and this one has also been connected with behavioral issues as well as skin irritation. So um, you have to be cognizant not only of spraying these chemicals on your skin, but if you think about all these aerosol sunscreens that people have, you know, has anybody ever been standing behind somebody when they're spraying sunscreen and you get this like cloud, you know, in, in your face of, of sunscreen? Respiratory effects of, of breathing in some of these chemicals can also be really damaging. And so um, I'm not a huge fan of especially the aerosol sprays. You want to do the, um, the, the sunscreens that you just, that you White, put on yourself. And you also want to do more mineral-based sunscreens. And so I have here a recipe for homemade sunscreen. You guys all have this recipe in the Health Hunter, which is in your packet there. And um, we will also make these slides available. We'll connect them to our YouTube page for all of our online viewers. Um, but as you can see with this recipe, the main ingredient that helps protect from the UV rays is the zinc oxide. And so you're using that, the zinc oxide on the skin, which, you know, zinc has a, a, has a powerful, you know, stimulating effect to the immune system. In addition, you know, some of that zinc gets absorbed through the skin. It's a mineral that the body needs. And when you look at all of the other ingredients in this recipe, like coconut oil, shea butter, pomegranate oil, not only are these, is this, this recipe helping to protect you from the sun, but it's going to leave your skin healthy and moisturized. And, you know, it's going to help, you know, if you do get some of the harmful effects of the UV rays, all of these, all of these oils are very nourishing to the skin and can help mitigate some of that, that damage. And so, you know, so it, this is the difference between when you use a chemical-based compound not only are you creating irritation to the skin as well as exposing yourself to these chemicals, but when you use the, the healthy alternative, you are still protecting yourself, but you're also nourishing the body and you're nourishing, 
you know, the skin, you know, this, this kind of in a way makes me think of when, when Dr. Reardon started the Reardon Clinic, Dr. Reardon was actually a psychiatrist. And so he started the Reardon Clinic measuring nutrient levels because he wanted to make correlations between people who, who suffered from mental health issues and the nutrients they were deficient in. But how the Reardon Clinic grew into what we do today is he found that as he started giving people nutrients, all of a sudden their digestion improved and their sleep improved and their skin you know, health improved. And so there were all these positive benefits you know, to giving people nutrients apart from helping their mental health. And so when you start kind of shifting more of your household products, more of your cosmetics, more to a natural alternative, Again, not only are you avoiding the chemicals, but you're also giving your body something that's nourishing it and that's, that's good for it. And so, um, so this is a great recipe for, for a homemade sunscreen. Um, if you're interested in looking at sunscreens you should avoid, there's a website um, called ewg.org. It's, it's, it's a group called the Environmental Working Group, and they have... They are probably one of the best resources for looking at chemicals and toxicity in our in our cosmetics and and in you know um, the sunscreens and the food and stuff that in the air that we breathe. Um, and they actually, if you download on your phone, they actually have an app called Skin Deep that has a barcode scanner. So, for instance, if you want to try this sunscreen, you scan the barcode, and the app will pull up all of the different chemical toxic ingredients in that in that product. And so it's a great resource for looking to see what you should what you should be purchasing and what not. Now again, you know, one of the best ways to do it is make it yourself because then you know exactly what's what's going in it. Um, you know, but they are a great resource for information. All right, so more recommendations. Um, if you do spend a lot of time out in the sun, keep an aloe plant in your house. You know, succulents are actually really in right now, so you can find aloe everywhere. Any, any greenhouse will have aloe growing, and it's a really easy plant to keep alive. I tell you, if I can keep it, you know, it alive, anybody can keep it alive, because I, I, I tend to kill plants. Um, but aloe plants, you know, if you get a little bit too much sun, get a little bit irritated, Break open the aloe plant, take the gel, and just rub it on, on the irritation. And it's very simple, very easy, and um, again, can kind of help with, with any irritation from the sun you might be exposed to. Um, if you do spend a lot of time out in the sun, you can make a hair mask. You know, so just simple you know, kitchen ingredients that you have, coconut oil, apple cider vinegar. You can, you can um, make you know, a paste. Put, you, put it on your hair, let that, that soak for about 20 to 30 minutes, and then rinse it out. And that will help nourish your hair and help protect it from, you know, again, some of the harmful effects of the sun. Lip, a lip salt scrub, you know, so combining a little bit of coconut oil, a little bit of sea salt, a little bit of either lime. You know, you can, um, you can uh, use lime peel or a little bit of lime juice. Or even if you have lime essential oil, you can just make up a lip scrub, scrub that on. That will exfoliate the lips. It will help keep them from drying out. And, you know, the benefit of that is you're about halfway to a margarita. So <laughs> you can't go wrong. <laughs> and then um, if you want to naturally lighten your hair, lemon juice. Um, I didn't actually mention this on the previous slide. If you, if you go back to the sunscreen slide, one thing, if you use essential oils, um, especially in a sunscreen or in a lotion. One thing you have to be aware of is, is the um, citrus essential oils can actually make you more sensitive to the sun. So when you put them on the skin, for instance, if you, if you put lemon essential oil or grapefruit or um, bergamot, any of those, those citrus-based essential oils, if you put that in your sunscreen, you're counteracting the effects of the zinc oxide, which protects you because the, the citrus oils are going to make you more sensitive. But you can kind of use that to your advantage, and you can use it as a natural hair lightener if you wanted to use a little bit of lemon juice. It's kind of a fun trick. All right, so spending time in the sun. One other thing I want to talk about in the summertime, which is another huge advantage that we get when spending time in the sun, is exercise. And exercise, you know, this is kind of one of those topics of conversation. I can, I can always feel the collective eye roll in the audience when we start talking about exercise, because everybody knows we should exercise. Everybody wants to, aspires to exercise every day, but 
for some reason, it's just hard to get over that hump of getting in the habit. And so summertime is an excellent time to start a new habit. It takes about three weeks, um, but, but exercise, you can actually kill two birds with one stone. Because if you get out and exercise during the summertime, not only are you getting the benefits of exercise, which we'll talk about here, but you could also get your 20 minutes of sunlight in. And then a third benefit also is you could start sweating, which we'll talk about sweating here in a second. But you could really kill about three birds with one stone by exercising in the summertime. And so, you know, exercise, because, you know, it's become such a common thing we all know we need to do, sometimes I think we lose sight of really how powerful exercise can be. And so I have some, some research here to share with you about some of the benefits of exercise that you might not have heard. So you can reduce your pain of arthritis by up to 47% which seems a bit counterintuitive because when we're in pain, we don't want to move a lot. But the more you move your joints, you know, the more you kind of you know, get rid of some of that inflammation, you can actually decrease your pain. And then also a sidebar on this, the month of June, um, Dr. Ron and Dr. Dustin Moffitt from our Hayes location will be giving a great lecture all about arthritis, joint pain, and natural regenerative injections that you can use. And so... Um, but exercise is free, it's easy to do, and again, it can reduce your pain up to 50%. Re reduce progression of dementia and Alzheimer's. You know, one of the best things you can do for your brain is exercise and move. Reduce progression of diabetes by up to 60%. If you've got a family history of diabetes or if your blood sugar is creeping up and you're in that pre-diabetic range, exercise is a great way to reverse, reverse that trend. Um, Postmenopausal women had a 41% decreased risk for hip fracture. And again, that goes back to a brain-based, you know, sort of thing and, and, and more balance and more stability the more you exercise. Reduced anxiety, you know, free Valium, you know, if, if you just get out and kind of start moving your body a bit. Um, reduced um, incidence of depression, up to 50% the more you exercise. 23% lower risk of death, just in general, death. You can cut your risk of death by a quarter just by getting out and exercising. And then this is also the number one treatment for fatigue. And so these are some great statistics around, you know, concerns that we all have about our health, and it, it all connects back to exercise. Now, the good news with all of this is all of that research I just presented was moderate amounts of low impact exercise. So that means, you know, about 30 minutes a day of low impact, meaning walking, 30 minutes a day of walking, 30 minutes a day of total walking. So that doesn't even have to be 30 minutes all at once. It could be a 15 minute walk in the morning and a 15 minute walk in the afternoon. And that's enough to, to realize the benefits, um, you know, that, that, that were on that previous slide. So it doesn't take a lot with exercise. Uh, it really on, it just takes kind of moving, um, you know, to get, get that, the benefits. So with exercise, a little bit goes a long way. And again, a lot of it is, is surrounding a habit. And so, um, you know, it's, it's summertime, like I said, because the days are longer, because we have, you know, more daylight available, because it's, it's, it's nicer outside, you know, it's a great time to get in that habit of just getting out and, and walking or getting out and moving on a daily basis. All right, seize the day. Here's my little ocean break. <laughs> All right, so moving on kind of to the, to the, to the next, next area we were gonna talk about, about avoiding chemicals during the summertime. Um, I will have to say probably one of my absolute favorite things about summertime are all of the fresh fruits and vegetables that are available to us during the summertime. And, um, you know, again, this is, again, goes back to our, our ancestors. You know, during the summertime, that was when a lot of fruit was ripe. And so that was, that was the time to kind of build up and store, store calories in the body. But unfortunately, in modern days today, all of the fresh fruit and vegetables are really more associated with a picture like this. And, this isn't the picture that we see very often. You know, this is what's happening kind of behind the scenes. But unfortunately, over about the past 20 to 25 years, there's been a radical shift in how a lot of our food 
is grown. And, uh, you know, I've, been, I've worked here at the Reardon Clinic now for almost, it's going on about five and a half years. And when I, I first started here, we developed the food as medicine class, which is a class we still do once a month. And when we first started that class, I would always talk a little bit about organics and how it's important to eat organic. You know, organic fruits and vegetables have more nutrients available in them. So, you know, get organic as much as possible. But the more I've studied this, to me, this has become more and more of a central piece in our overall health. Because when you look at what's happening to our food, kind of behind the scenes, you know, we don't feel the effects of these chemicals immediately when we eat foods, but the cumulative effect over time, you know, is having a dramatic effect on our health. And so some of the research that I came across that really, really highlighted that to me, I want to show you now. Um, so here we go. So one of the most heavily used agricultural chemicals of all time is something called glyphosate or otherwise known as Roundup. You know, everybody's probably used a little bit of Roundup on the weeds in your yard and thought it's a pretty harmless chemical. They, you can buy it, you know, you know, at, at pretty much any, any, any greenhouse. And so it's, it's pretty harmless, right? Well, when you look at how much Roundup we use, if you go back to 1987, they, they were, farmers were using about 11 million pounds per year in the United States. Um, currently, farmers are now using over 300 million pounds per year. So that is a dramatic increase in the amount of, of, of chemicals, specifically you know, this, this herbicide that we're using. The World Health Organization deemed glyphosate a probable human carcinogen. And this is why most European countries don't use it. Um, it's, it's pretty much mostly used here in the United States um, exclusively. And so the reason glyphosate took this huge jump from 11 million to 300 million in such a short time period is um, when you look back in the mid 90s, there was, there, was, there was a huge invention that, that Monsanto, um, which is you know, an, an agricultural company, they introduced seeds for certain crops that were called Roundup Ready. So they introduced Roundup Ready corn, Roundup Ready soy, Roundup Ready wheat. You know, and these were seeds that grew plants that were resistant to the herbicide Roundup, which was great news for farmers because now farmers could use a whole lot more Roundup without killing the plants. It would just selectively kill the weeds. And the way that, that this got passed through the, the FDA at the time was, you know, farmers were told that this herbicide does not affect human cells, that the biochemical pathway that this, this chemical affects does not affect human cells, which is true. But what we didn't know back in the mid-90s that we do know now today is that we have about 10 times the number of bacterial cells either in us or on us. So we are actually more bacterial cells than we are our own cells. And bacteria are highly susceptible to this chemical. And so, um, so I'm going to show you some of the statistics here, but just keep in mind that it was right here during the mid-90s that there was this huge increase in the use of, of Roundup. And so let's see what that did to our health. So when we look at, at, a, at a graph of um, deaths due to obesity, the obesity rates, you know, again, you think back to the 80s, you didn't see obese Americans. I mean, it was, it was much fewer and far between. But when you look at here, the mid-90s, this is where things start to increase. And then look at this huge surge to where we're at today. Trends had continued, you know, it would have been a whole lot less than what we see today. Autism, same thing. Everybody knows autism used to be one in 10,000. Now we're down to, I think, one in 65 boys is born with autism. So, um, you know, so you have this sharp increase in the rates of autism. Dementia, again, mid-90s right here. And then you see this sharp increase in the rates of dementia. Hypertension, same thing, mid-90s, sharp increase. Leukemia, again, sharp increase. Parkinson's, same thing, steady increase, sharp increase during the 90s. Stroke, same thing, you have a steady increase and then this sh sharp dramatic increase. Thyroid cancer, again, steady 
till the mid 90s. So, you know, so this is, you know, what, what connects a lot of these, these conditions, um, you know, to the use of Roundup is our gut bacteria. There's a lot of research to suggest, especially a lot of the brain-based disorders have a root cause in, you know, disruption of our microbiome and our disruption of the bacteria. And so, you know, so as we kind of get into summertime and fruits and vegetables are, are you know, ripe and in season, some of the best things you can do to protect yourself are number one, grow your own garden. <laughs> Cause then you know exactly what's used, you know, in the production of, of that food. And so that is absolutely the number one best way um, to ensure that your food is clean and safe. But second to that, you could find a local community sponsored agriculture, you know, CSA. Um, there are a number of, of local ones. You know, one that I'm familiar with is one called Bountiful Baskets. And they even have an organic version to where you can once a week or once every other week pick up, you know, a whole bushel full of, um, you know, produce that's in season that's available from local farmers. And so that's a, that's a great way to get fresh, fresh produce that's clean. Next, you know, buy organic as much as possible, um, especially the Dirty Dozen. I'll give you this list here in just a second, but the Dirty Dozen is a list put out by that, that group I just was talking about, the Environmental Working Group, and they just released the 2018 list as far as the fruits and vegetables that have the most amount of pesticides and herbicides used on them. Wash all of your fruits and vegetables with some sort of a cleanser to remove any residue. You know, just because it's organic doesn't mean that it's 100% clean. You know, there's still a residue, and especially if you buy any conventional produce, you'll want to wash it with, you know, with a cleanser, which I'll give you that recipe here in just a second. And then you can also strategically start to grow certain plants that will act as a natural insecticide. It'll naturally repel the bugs that, that, that could try and get into your garden. And so also in your Health Hunter newsletter, there's a whole list of different herbs and spices that you can plant that not only can you eat those herbs and use those in your cooking, but they also will naturally keep bugs away. And so we're, we experimented with this. We planted a whole bunch of different marigolds. We planted... Um, citrus, you know, smelling. So like a, it was a, a lemon thyme. Um, we planted lavender, um, basil, chives. A lot of those will help keep mosquitoes and bugs away. And so I'll let you know how that, how our experiment goes, but we planted all of that around our garden to see if we can't, you know, can't keep a lot of that away. So here's a list of the dirty dozen. So this is, this is the 2018 list. So Number one on the list is strawberries. Strawberries are now, they have surpassed apples and spinach as the worst, um, you know, food when it comes to, um, when it comes to using um, insectic, er, herbicides and, and pesticides. So, um, so certain things like strawberries, spinach, nectarines, apples, grapes, peaches, cherries, tomatoes, pears, celery, potatoes, and sweet bell peppers. Those are the 12 worst fruits and vegetables. If you can just buy those fruits and vegetables organic, you will cut down on a significant amount of the pesticides you're exposed to. Now, just washing your fruit and vegetable, it will take off a lot of the residue, um, but a lot of these chemicals actually get into the plant and they'll get into the, the fruit and the vegetables. And so just washing it doesn't remove you know, all of them. Now, the Environmental Working Group also put, puts this list out. This is called the Clean 15. So really, they put out a list of it's about 50 or 60 different foods. So the Dirty Dozen are the 12 worst foods when it comes to pesticide use. And the Clean 15 are the, the cleanest, you know, when it comes to pesticides. So these had the least amount of pesticide um, residue on them or in them. And so if it's not in the budget, these are the ones that you can buy conventional and not worry quite so much about. You know, so certain ones like avocados, sweet corn, non-GMO, organic sweet corn, um, you know, pineapples. A lot of these have um, a shell on the outside. And so that, you know, cantaloupes, um, honeydews, you know, so that, that helps protect these plants, you know, from a lot of those. And then plus some of, some of these plants just do better. They're not as susceptible to, to disease. And so um, they, grow, they grow better without without the, the chemicals. 
But like I said, if you go on the website, ewg.org, they have the full list of all of these fruits and vegetables. And like I said, they test this stuff once a year. So once a year, they put out this list of, of some of the worst fruits and vegetables as far as um, chemical, chemical pesticides and herbicides. So here's the, the, the fruit and vegetable wash recipe. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't think this is in the Health Hunter. If not, you might just jot this down. It's a real easy recipe. Eight ounces of filtered water, one teaspoon of lemon juice, and one teaspoon of white vinegar. I make a big bottle of this, and I leave it under the sink. And then when I, for instance, if I, if I get a, a bunch of grapes, I'll put the grapes in a colander. I'll spray them down with this, and then I let it sit, you know, for at least a few minutes. And then I rinse, rinse it off. And so, um, you know, and that will remove at least 80% of the residue on the outside of fruits and vegetables. And so this is the cheapest way to make a wash. You know, don't waste your money buying the real expensive fruit and vegetable washes at the grocery store. This is the cheapest, easiest way to do it. And it's very, very effective at removing a lot of the chemicals. All right. Moving on, the next section. Again, my, my, little, my little brain break here, my ocean. My, we're, we're taking our kids to Jamaica on Sunday, and so my brain is already, already at the beach. <laughs> All right, so sweat and detox. This is something that, you know, in today's world, nobody really likes to sweat anymore. You know, have you, have you thought about that? You know, we, 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 we like to move from one temperature controlled environment to another you know we're not comfortable we're not comfortable with 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 sweat and so but again you go back to our ancestors they would sweat a lot you know being outside and you know interestingly enough there was um they, they did a study on vitamin d levels of the people in barcelona spain which barcelona spain has one of the highest numbers of days of sunshine per year. And what they found was even though people spent time outside, even though they got exposed to a lot of sunlight, they still had the majority of their population was deficient in vitamin D. And so why do you think that is? You know, if they're getting a lot of sunlight compared to, they compared it to some indigenous African tribes that also got exposed to a lot of sunlight. But what do you think the difference was between the two groups that, that made this, the Spanish people, their vitamin D levels less? Well, they sweat, and what do we do immediately after we sweat? We take a shower, you know. So vitamin D is produced, you know, in, you know, the epidermis in, the, in, in a layer of skin. And so when you go shower, you start washing and sloughing off all those skin cells. You start, you know, you start wiping away, you know, the, the cells that are producing the vitamin D. And so sweat is, you know, even though an uncomfortable sort of thing and nobody likes to do it, it's an important mode of detox. And so the body, you know, when, when it comes to getting rid of chemicals, the body has kind of three main ways of doing it. Um, one is through the, the, the bladder and the bowels, you know, so that's a big way that we eliminate waste. Um, the second is through our breath, you know, so we breathe off chemical waste, you know, carbon dioxide. Um, and then the third one is sweat. And so when we sweat, you know, we are ridding the body of, of toxins. And so the reason people's sweat start to smell is if you've got a bit of a bacterial infection on the skin and then you get it wet, that's, you know, the, um, the smell that you start to get associated with body odor. Dr. Reardon used to always say, if you stink, you need anybody zinc. Yeah, you need zinc. And so, and part of the reason, you know, that zinc is, is great for that is zinc is a, is a powerful simulator of the immune system. So for helping to get rid of, you know, bacterial infections. And so, um, you know, so one idea I would encourage is to get comfortable with, with getting sweaty. You know, it's, it's actually a really, really good thing. And again, this goes back to summertime. You know, you could quite literally kill all the birds. Everything I've talked about with one stone, if you get outside and you garden, which is a form of exercise in the sun while you're sweating. You'll get your vitamin D, you'll get your exercise, you'll sweat and you'll detox and you'll be growing wonderful, healthy vegetables. And so, um, so ways, you know, you can induce sweating, of course, exercise. Exercise is one of the best ways to, to, to sweat and to, to get your body really sweating. 
Um, you can also use detox baths. Is anybody familiar with, with detox baths? Um, you know, when you, when you do a detox bath, you, you essentially want to get the, the water temperature, you know, as hot as you can stand it. You can add equal parts of Epsom salts and baking soda. And then there are different essential oils that you can use that also not only stimulate detox, but also just kind of help relax you or invigorate you, you know, depending on kind of what you're wanting to do the bath for. But if you get the water hot enough and you use some of these, these detox modes, what you'll actually find is if you got out of the bath in the middle of it, you'd be sweating. You know, you don't feel it quite as much because you're in the bathtub, but it, it does induce a bit of a detox reaction. Um, you could also use um, betonite clay. You could use algae. There's a lot of peat moss. There's a lot of different things you can use to kind of help create a detox bath that works well for you. Infrared saunas. Infrared saunas are an excellent way to induce sweating. I mean, saunas in general, you know, just, you know, being in a heated environment will stimulate the body to sweat. But the difference between a radiant heat sauna and an infrared sauna is in the radiant heat sauna, you're not penetrating that heat very deep. So the, the temperature in the room is a lot hotter in a radiant heat sauna or a steam sauna, and you're not pulling toxins from quite as deep in the body. Whereas the infrared saunas, the infrared penetrates deeper, so you pull toxins from deeper layers in the body. And so you pull the toxins, and then you induce sweating, and so you're able to, to get rid of it. So infrared saunas are great not only for detox, they're great if you're sick because they induce a bit of a fever state. You know, when the temperature of the body rises, that will kill a bacteria or a viral infection. Um, you know, saunas are great for if you want to stimulate weight loss, stimulate metabolism. Um, and then, like I said, all of that is stimulated when you sweat and when you detox. So we have an infrared sauna here at the Reardon Clinic, or, you know, there are many home units that are available for purchase that are very affordable. You know, I recommend get a few friends, go in together, buy a sauna, and then just rotate use of it. Um, you know, but infrared saunas are a great way to, to, to sweat on a regular basis. Especially, I will say this too, some people have a hard time sweating. Has anybody ever known somebody like that where it's like no matter what they do, they just, they can't quite stimulate a good sweat? Infrared saunas are a great way to get to that, that, that detox moving. Because sometimes it's a sign you need to detox as if your body has a hard time sweating. Um, and so... Infrared saunas are a great way to do that. And then just being outside, you know, being outside in the sunshine, being outside in the heat will stimulate the body to sweat. Now, um, one other thing you can do to support detox during the summertime is consume foods that support the liver with detoxification. And so some of the foods that, that help do that, I mean, probably the one I would put a big gold star by are your cruciferous vegetables. You know, so broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, all of those have something in them called sephoraphane, which is really important for helping the liver to detoxify. But really, you know, any of these leafy greens, citrus fruits, lemons, so putting, squeezing some lemon, you know, in your water or putting a few drops of lemon essential oil is a great way to, to support like a daily detox. Um, you know, of course, these fresh herbs, that you can either use fresh or you could steep them as teas, turmeric, dandelion root, peppermint, milk thistle, ginger, all of those you can, um, you can like I said, steep as a tea. Um, if you do juicing, you can juice a lot of these, these fresh herbs, grow a bunch of them in your garden and then throw them in a smoothie or you know, you throw them in your, your juicer and, and juice a lot of them. And, that's a great way to, to, to get the body all the nutrients it needs to continue to detoxify. So some of the recommendations around this, you know, of course, make healthy, fresh, organic fruits and vegetables kind of the centerpiece of your diet this summer. You know, summer is a great time to play around with fruits and vegetables that you don't normally eat. You know, so go to the farmer's market. Wichita has got some amazing Farmers markets on the west side in Old Town, Green Acres has one every Tuesday. So go to some of these farmers markets and find a fruit or vegetable that you don't recognize. And talk to the farmer there, ask, you know, what are some ways you can cook that? How can you use that? Because they'll give you a lot of great ideas of things you wouldn't possibly even think of. Like I, one of the things I remember when I lived in Seattle, 
Seattle, that's when I fell in love with farmer's markets. And that's also where I fell in love with fresh beets. Does anybody else love fresh beets? <laughs> I love fresh beets. Um, thanks to talking to a farmer when I was in Seattle. And what he told me is he was like, you know, don't throw the leaves away. He's like, you can take the leaves of the beets, wash them, and you can saute them and use them just like you would use Swiss chard or spinach or any of the other leafy greens. You can throw them in a smoothie. And so, um, you know, so talk with the farmers that grow these fruits and vegetables, and they have a lot of great ideas that, um, you know, that, that you, could, you could use to incorporate them into your diet. Because with a lot of these fruits and vegetables, it's, it's, it's finding the right way to cook it, finding the right way to prepare it. And, you know, the more you try, the more variety of fruits and vegetables you try, you know, our bodies tend to be real intuitive with what it needs. So for instance, part of the reason why I think I love beets is because beets are one of the highest vegetables in something called betaine. And you need betaine for methylation. And I'm an undermethylator. So when I eat beets and I get that betaine, my body loves it. My body can use it. And so therefore, beets taste really good to me. I also, I have this theory. So when I was in high school, I used to love to go out in the sun and I would quite literally just bake in the sun. And it was my favorite thing to do because I'd start sweating and I, I couldn't explain it. But after spending an afternoon laying out in the sun and reading my book, I just felt really, really good. Well, as an adult, I've come to realize I've got that VDR mutation. I have a harder time making vitamin D. And so being out in the sun was, it was, I think I was just craving that vitamin D and it, that became real apparent to me also the year I lived in Seattle because there's not very much sunlight and I had a horrible time over the winter there, you know, not having enough sunlight. And the more I've taken vitamin D as an adult, I enjoy being in the sun, but I don't need a bake like I used to when I was little. So, um, so recommendations, again, find opportunities to sweat, you know, as much as you can. And when you do, one thing to, to watch out for is using antiperspirants. So, you know, hopefully, I, I don't know if everybody knows, you know, you can buy an antiperspirant or a deodorant. And there's a difference between the two. You know, the deodorant just kind of makes you smell good. But the antiperspirant actually has, you know, certain agents in it that block sweat, and so the, the main ingredient that is used to block sweat is aluminum. And aluminum is also a mimicker of estrogen. And so the research is a bit inconclusive as far as the connection between, uh, you know, aluminum and breast cancers. But I don't think it's a coincidence that, you know, as breast cancer rates have been increasing, you know, not only is the aluminum being put right here in the skin that is right next to the lymphatics of the breast, but when you use aluminum and you block sweating of the armpits, you block the body's detoxification mode. And so, um, you know, so I recommend find, you know, a, 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 a aluminum-free deodorant. And again, you kind of have to get used to the fact that you're not going to have dry, dry armpits all the time. They're going to be a little bit mushy, um, you know, but, and you're going to have to reapply. I keep deodorant, you know, a stashed in strategic places, and I'll reapply, especially during the summertime. But um, but this is a great way to, you know, again, not be putting chemicals in your body that could be contributing to cancer rates. And it's especially more so even than cancer, it's, you know, we're, a lot of these chemicals I mentioned are endocrine disruptors, you know, so the, the we, and it's usually not just one of these in isolation. You know, it's usually the fact that people are using the aluminum in their deodorants, they're also heating up their food in plastic containers and leaching the plastic, you know, into their food. They're drinking things out of aluminum cans where the aluminum has been leached into the drink. They're eating foods out of a can where the BPA that's been sprayed on the inside of the can has leached into the food. You know, so it's, it, they're, they're putting cosmetics on their skin that contain these endocrine disruptors. And so it, it's all these drops that are kind of filling up that cup that are contributing to this toxic burden that we all have to deal with. And so I, I can say that, you know, the, the number of people I see that are dealing with hormone issues is a testament to the fact that there are, there is something we are exposing ourselves to that is dysregulating this system. And so, so any step you can take, such as switching your deodorant over to something that doesn't contain aluminum, 
you know, is going to be a great step toward reducing that, that toxic burden that you're exposed to on a regular basis. And so I, 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 will, I will say this, I have to admit, I am still on the hunt for a great deodorant. I've, you know, there, there are different brands out there that, that work pretty well. I have not found the holy grail, though, of deodorant. And as soon as I do, I will let you know. Or if any of you out there have any recommendations, I am open to try. Um, you know, but it, it is, a, like I said, a, a tricky balance trying to find something. And I have to admit, I'm, I am a sweater. I, that's, that is in my jeans. And so, um, so I need something pretty heavy duty. <laughs> All right. Cheers to summertime. This is, this is the end of the lecture. And so I thought it fitting end of the lecture, you know, kind of sailing into vacation mode that, that we do a, do a bit of a cheers. And so I'll open up the floor. We have, um, a little under 10 minutes for any questions that anybody might have or any deodorant recommendations you can make. <laughs> but um, does anybody have any questions in the audience? Yeah. You know, the crystal solid, that is one that I, I, I've heard works great. Um, I actually haven't tried that one myself. I don't know why. I just it kind of grosses me out a little bit. And so I just haven't, <laughs> haven't done that one in particular, but I've, I've heard from some people that love it and it works great for them. So actually the most recent one that I heard from a patient is she was told to take milk of magnesia, which I guess is, is contains magnesium, which might have some sort of an effect, but she rubs that on and she said that works better than any natural deodorant. So maybe some, I haven't tried that one yet, but that was a brand new one to me that, that I had heard. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was um, in the gardening section, CSA. CSA is basically a co-op. So it stands for Community Sponsored Agriculture. And what CSAs are is basically a, a co-op of farmers gets together and they will uh, kind of put together a basket of fruits and vegetables, uh, fruits and vegetables that are in season. And so um, you, will, you buy into this, this co-op and you pay you know, per week or every other week or per month and you get a whole basket of whatever's in season. So it's a great way to not only support local businesses and local farmers, but it also keeps you eating in season, you know, because, you know, one thing I didn't mention with, with a lot of fruits and vegetables that we eat, especially, you know, since we've gotten used to the fact that we can have pretty much whatever fruit and vegetable we want any time of year, a lot of those are shipped in from other parts of the world. And so to get fruits and vegetables from other parts of the world into the grocery stores, those fruits and vegetables have to be picked when they aren't yet ripe. And so grocery stores will ripen those fruits and vegetables with an ethylene gas once they're there. And so, um, you know, so a lot of the fruits and vegetables we're eating are not nearly as nutrient dense as they could be if they were allowed to ripen on the vine. And so when you support that, the local farmers, you're getting fresh produce that is in season. A lot of times it's, it's organic. Um, and like I said, it's a great way to support local, local farmers and local businesses. Um, you do have to be careful. It goes bad a lot faster. You know, we get used to this, the, you know, the, the, the stuff we buy at the store, which tends to last, especially, you know, more conventional produce will last longer, say, than organic. Because again, you know, back in the mid nineties, when Monsanto started to genetically alter seeds, you know, they started to select for certain qualities, which is why they made some of these seeds resistant to Roundup. But some of the other qualities they selected for were, you know, apples that don't bruise or apples that are shiny and red or apples that are sweeter. And so they're selecting for qualities in these fruits and vegetables that make them more appealing to us, but don't necessarily make them more nutritious for us. And so by virtue of that, the, the nutritional value of a lot of our fruits and vegetables is a lot less today than it was 50, 75 years ago. So the question is, if the rest of the world has banned Roundup, what do they use? And that's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm sure they use other types of herbicides and insecticides, um, you know, but 
I, I do know that here in the United States, you know, it's kind of like the, the issue with antibiotics that we're seeing. You know, it's, 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 it's a definitely a Goldilocks complex in the sense that antibiotics have been one of the best, most life-saving inventions of, you know, our time. And, and, um, but yet a bit is good, but overuse of antibiotics, you start to develop you know, antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria. So I think the same thing holds true with these, these chemicals, the herbicides and pesticides. A little bit might be beneficial in the sense that you get higher yield, we can feed the world, we get all these crops, but too much of it now, they're seeing the same sorts of effect where here in the United States, they're having to use stronger and stronger chemicals to kill some of these bugs because the Roundup isn't enough. So I, I, to answer your question, I'm not sure what other countries use um, maybe, do you have a comment on that, Jocelyn? My daughter was in France, and um, she, she can't get her vegetables anymore because of the mm. They're not available, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. On garden, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so what Jocelyn was saying is her daughter lives in France. This is for our, our online audience that her daughter lives in France, and they just have the mentality that there's certain foods they can't get all year round, you know, and, and by virtue of the fact that they aren't grown during certain seasons. And so I think that, that makes a big difference. And, um, you know, I will say anecdotally, I've had a number of patients that can't do a lot of the grains here in the United States, the wheat and the corn, and they go to Europe. And their digestive system can handle it just fine. And so, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that the top allergens that we see today are wheat, corn, soy, dairy. You know, all of these these foods that are are the the, the heavy use of pesticides and herbicides. And then even once these foods are harvested in such large quantities to store them, they're sprayed with a lot of fungicides. And so. I, I don't think it's a coincidence that these are the top allergy foods that we're seeing today. And that I don't think it's a coincidence that leaky gut, you know, there's, I, I meant to put a picture. I've got a picture of, it's, it's a, it's a slide, a bacterial slide of looking at, you know, um, a, a cross section of the small intestine. And when you expose some of those cells to glyphosate, it creates an environment of leakiness. And so, you know, so the heavy use of, and the heavy consumption of a lot of these chemicals is contributing to this this inflammatory bowel, this this leaky gut that 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 we see so very often. You know, with 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 a lot of people, and so, you know, again, the, some of the best ways to counteract it are, of course, to avoid as many of these herbicides as you can. But then, the the other thing that that you really really want to make sure you're on top of is getting a lot of the good bacteria. You know, so I have been dosing probiotics higher and higher. You want to do fermented foods, as many varieties of fermented foods as you can, um, you know, to get to replenish that good bacteria. Make sure you're eating a lot of good fruits and vegetables, which have the prebiotic fiber to feed that bacteria. And that will help with counter, counterbalance some, some of the effects of, of these chemicals that we see. All right, does anybody else have any questions for me? Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, how how is the best way to take probiotics? And you know, a lot of it depends on who you ask. You know, my my uh, typical recommendation for probiotics is to do them before bed, um, especially you know if if you're not taking a lot of other supplements. Um, so I do recommend doing them before bed. But, you know, I would say to take them is better than to not take them. And so if, if, if there's a better way where, you know, you can stay more consistent with it, then that, that would be fine. But I, I, I in, in, in my um, practice, I've found the best, the, the best results with them doing them before bed with patients. So, I mean, the, the way that I kind of and, and think about it in my brain is when you're eating all day long, you know, your body and your digestive system have, you know, have, have a big job to do with, you know, digesting all the food. And so at nighttime, you know, I, I, I think it's just easier to kind of populate 
the gut, you know, populate the, the system. Now, some people get concerned about the stomach acid. You know, that's why they say do it with food so that the bacteria can get through the stomach acid because your bacteria have to make it where, where most of your bacteria reside is in your colon. So that those, those probiotics have to make it through the stomach and the small intestine to, to get to the, to the large intestine of the colon where they, they do the most good. And so, um, you know, so that, that's the reason why some people say to do it with food. And so, but my, like I said, my recommendation is typically to do as many great probiotic rich foods throughout the day. And then you want to use the supplement to populate certain strains that sometimes are harder to get with foods or to do kind of a, a higher dose all at once. And so, but really food is the best way to get your, your probiotics. And, and again, not only to get the good bacteria, but to feed that bacteria. You know, they've looked at the population of, of, of you know, bacteria in people who eat mostly like a meat and potatoes diet. They switch them over to a, to a, a vegetable produce-based diet, and within a week, the composition of their bacteria had changed just by changing the food because what you eat feeds your bacteria and communicates with that bacteria. So, um, so it, it really does come down to, you know, diet. You don't want to just rely on supplements, but what you get in your diet is also really important. So. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. There is a survey. If you don't mind filling that, write down any ideas you guys have for classes coming up. Um, we're starting to plan, believe it or not, 2019. So write down, you know, any any lecture ideas of, you know, what what you guys would like to hear um, hear about. And again, a lot, all, almost all the recipes that I had in this slide presentation are in this month's Health Hunter. So May 2018 Health Hunter has a lot of these these recipes. I strongly encourage you guys to, to just start with one thing. Pick one thing that you're going to make by yourself, like a household cleaner, a lotion, something. Just start with something, even if it's just, like I said, that fruit and vegetable wash. It's very simple. But it, what, what you'll find is the more you make on your own, not only are you going to start saving money because it's less expensive, you'll find these products work better than a lot of your you know, chemical-based products. And, and two, like I said, you'll find that not only are they going to have the desired effects you want, but they're also going to have a lot of other positive side effects. And so, um, you know, so, so definitely I strongly encourage you to, 